famous Bishop's Avenue. We have some of the most expensive houses in the country. It's on this road. Bishop's Avenue. Probably do a video of um, some of these houses one day. Go around and take them.
faces what should be a more procedural vote in the Senate. Bar any last minute surprises, he'll be nominated as First Minister and can get on with the job of choosing his cabinet. Who he chooses may reveal who he intends to heal Senator Rifts, which have emerged within Labour after his acceptance of a £200,000 donation from a company whose owner was prosecuted for illegally dumping waste. Mr. Gething has refused to return the money, but has promised a review. That may not be enough to satisfy some of his critics, both inside and outside the party. Figures released in the past few minutes show inflation fell to its lowest level in more than two years at 3.4% in February. It had been 4% in January. The Advertising Standards Authority has ruled that a newspaper ad for the supermarket Aldi which it claimed it was the home of Britain's cheapest Christmas dinner, was misleading. The claim was based on research by the consumer group Which, showing only four pence difference between Aldi and its rival Lidl. Aldi said it was disappointed the complaint had been upheld on what it called an advertising technicality. Thanks, Jane. It's eight minutes past seven. And as we've just heard, figures just out from the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, have put the latest inflation figures at 3.4%, the lowest level in more than two years. Now, UK inflation was 4% in December and January, um, but the Prime Minister will be pleased things seem to be moving in the right direction. He entered Downing Street when inflation peaked at 11.1% in October 22, and two of his key pledges to voters this election year uh, are to get inflation and, crucially, interest interest rates down as well, which would mean cheaper mortgages. Well, Grant Fitz, no, the chief economist at the Office for National Statistics. Good morning. Are you there, Grant Fitzner? Grant Fitzner. Grant Fitzner, well, then we will be hoping very much to join Grant Fitzner as soon as possible to talk about those new figures just out from the Office of National Statistics, um, showing that the latest inflation figures are 3.4%, which is the lowest level in more than two years. He's too busy interpreting those figures for us. I think it would probably come to him uh, slightly earlier than expected. Well, tell you what, we'll go to our, our main uh, story this morning, which is, uh, as you heard from Jane in the bulletin there, about the fact that the Home Office is today announcing the ban of 15 new synthetic opioids. Uh, those opioids, some of which are called nitazines, are lab-developed alternatives to heroin, uh, which are much stronger than heroin, and which addicts, police, and the government say are a growing problem. Dr. Caroline Copeland is a senior lecturer in pharmacology and toxicology at King's College London. She's a member of the novel Psychoactive, Psychoactive Substances Subcommittee of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, the ACFD. And she's one of the people who advised the government on these new rules that they're being put in today. And uh, she joins us now. Dr. Copeland, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for coming in, especially to the Australian Girls. Our previous guest is very good to see you. Uh, just to start with the basics, what are some things you so synthetic opioids are those that are made in, as opposed to those which uh, naturally occur in the opium poppy that can be cultivated. And are they easy to make? Is that one of the attractions of those doing them? Are they easy to make and cheaper to ship? Uh, easier to make, cheaper to make and easier to ship because they're so potent. You only need to smuggle a small amount that they then can be diluted um, at the place that they've been shipped to. And what effect do they have on the user? What's their ph if you're pharmacological effect? So they are uh, opioids, so they are sedatives. They can uh, produce uh, um, sedation, uh, an element of euphoria, uh, but also respiratory depression, so stopping the breathing. And that's what's really worrying with these compounds. One of the pieces of advice that's given to people who use drugs is to go slow. And if a speck of dust is the amount that's enough to cause an overdose, it's very difficult to go slow. And so well, that really is the case, a speck of dust is enough to cause an overdose. So how much stronger are they than heroin? So if we say that heroin potency is about you know, one, fentanyl, which we know is a big problem in the US, is about 50 times stronger than heroin. And these nitazine compounds are anywhere between the same potency as heroin, so 50 times, up to 500 times more potent than heroin. How many problems do we have? What do we know about how many of the sorts of evidence we're using about how many of them are on the streets in this country? So there's evidence from police seizures that they're in heroin supplies, but also counterfeit tablets as well. So it's not just 
heroin users who are at risk of overdose from these drugs. Uh, we've also seen them appear, sadly, particularly last summer, in a number of deaths already uh, in pockets around the country. And do you know if this sort of idea of replacing uh, heroin with synthetic heroin, obviously synthetic drugs are nothing particularly new, but are we seeing similar synthetic alternatives to, say, cocaine? So we are starting to see uh, synthetic stimulants, so cocaine, which um, uh, stimulates the body. We are seeing some of those appear as well at a greater rate than previously. Okay, do you think we've got the right rules in place to deal with this stuff? I think that uh, increasing the penalties for supply and manufacture is a good thing, but I don't know how much of a deterrent uh, it will be. Uh, and what we really need is action for um, to reduce the demand. So that's at the user level and to reduce uh, the need for these people uh, to whether they need to use drugs in the first place. Fascinating. And we return to the subject of data for now, Dr. Caroline Copeland. Thank you very much for you. Thank you. It's 13 minutes past seven and we can go uh, back to those new inflation figures just out from the Office of National Statistics. Grant Fitzner, Chief Economist at the Office for National Statistics, I believe you are with us now. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Uh, we missed you a little bit earlier there. Um, the inflation figures, they're lower uh, than had been predicted. They're now the lowest level in more than two years at 3.4%. That's right. And uh, a number of factors were driving that, but particularly the rate of annual food price inflation has come down quite a bit, down from 6.9% to 5%. And that's 11 consecutive monthly falls that we've seen in food price inflation. Uh, and in fact, we haven't really seen that much change in food prices for the last nine months or so. They've been almost flat. We also saw restaurant and household, uh, restaurant and hotel annual inflation rates fall back as well. And then, no, no surprise, motorists out there partly offsetting that sum up to petrol and diesel prices in the last month. But I think the general trend uh, continues to be lower. You say the trend, so you're predicting more good news next month. Can we expect those lower energy prices to be reflected? Well, we don't forecast uh, the national statistics, but it's fair to say that other economic commentators out there, including the Bank of England, the Office of Budget Responsibility, are all projecting further falls in inflation uh, in coming months. Now, that's reflecting a number of things, but of course, one of them, one of these three prices, but another is lower energy prices as well. Now, of course, some of the issues are out of the UK's control, like the cost of shipping because of problems uh, at the moment in, in the Red Sea. But do you think that inflation could hit the Bank of England target of 2% by the summer? You're talking of a trend. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of speculation about the Red Sea in coming months, but we're really not seeing that either in the inflation numbers or in the trade statistics. Um, and indeed, what, one factor to bear in mind there is it's partly offsetting any potential increases, for example, in shipping costs. Uh, we've seen the we've seen sterling exchange rate index increase for four consecutive months. So uh, that does mean our ability to pay for imports has improved uh, in recent months. In terms of overall inflation trends, I think it's worth pointing out that obviously prices are still going up. They're still higher than they were a year ago or two years ago. The rate of inflation has come down markedly. Thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Fitzner, the Grant Fitzner, and of course the Bank of England will be meeting tomorrow to discuss uh, interest rates, so we'll be covering that. Time now is 16 minutes past seven. And the Information Commissioner's Office is assessing a report that staff at the clinic where the Princess of Wales underwent surgery tried to view her private health information. The Daily Mirror claimed that staff at the London Clinic, which is frequently used by the Royals, attempted to access her private medical reports. The BBC hasn't been able to independently excuse me, verify the Mirror's uh, reporting. Well, Simon Lewis is Communications Secretary, uh, was Communications Secretary to the Queen between 1998 and 2000. He's also the co-presenter, of course, of the podcast, When It Hits the Fan, and he was formerly Director of Communications for the former Labour Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. Good morning to you. Good morning. Now, um, what do you make of these reports that at this clinic, which you know has been really trusted by the royal family, was trying to access uh, those, you know, that private medical information? Well, as you say, we don't know whether it's actually correct, but for me, the more important point is this is exactly why I would have thought the princess and the people around her are so concerned about her privacy. I mean, going to hospital at the best of times is a very stressful experience, but to think there's a possibility of people actually accessing your records 
whilst you're there. No, no wonder this debate about privacy, members of the royal family and other public figures continues, because that's the key point. <laughs> there is a line, as far as I'm concerned, where privacy should be absolutely sacrosanct. And the London Clinic does say that, you know, it, from its perspective, patient information, regardless of their status, you know, must remain private. What, what's your reaction to Kensington Palace's response? It's declined to confirm or deny these reports. Well, I think that's fair enough, and you know, the, the royal family have used that clinic, which has a fine reputation over generations. So, I think, as I say, I think the bigger issue is why is there so much interest in the Princess of Wales and her health at this time? I mean, there was a survey yesterday that showed, I think, 50% of the people surveyed had seen a, some of the conspiracy theories about the Princess of Wales herself. So there's a vortex. I know this happened when she was in hospital, but what we're still seeing is this unacceptable, I think, level of interest in her health and when and how she's going to return to public life. So it's all part of a bigger picture, I think, about the way in which figures in public... And it happened, you mentioned Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown had a similar issue with one of his children and privacy and health records. So I think there's a there's an issue about figures in public life, but there's a specific, specific issue about the Princess of Wales now. So I think that's where we are. So what can Kensington Palace do to regain control of, of the narrative? You've spoken, you know, you mentioned the vortex there as if it's just spiralling out of control. Well, actually, maybe a better word is, is vacuum, actually, because, again, what's happened, although the Kensington Palace statement of the thing was factually accurate, I mean, they said the Princess would not be the public eye until Easter, and not even at Easter. And I, I would have thought, and I don't know, that Kensington Palace are thinking now about a way of slowly reintroducing the princess to public life. There'll be engagements, there'll be opportunities for her to be seen. And my hunch is, and it's just a hunch, that as soon as that happens, a lot of this will go away because the, the, the curious thing about the royal family monarchy is the importance of visibility. And the contrast with the king is interesting because obviously the king is the sovereign, there's a full statement about his health. He has been seen, quite rightly, or well, that must be very difficult for him. He's, he's undergoing treatment. But in my view, the Princess of Wales there's a different set of requirements. So if she can slowly come back to public life the way that appears to be in plan, I suspect we'll see a quite different change in public attitudes. And I think there's huge support, huge support for amongst the British people. Simon Lewis, thank you very much indeed. The latest edition, of course, of your podcast, which discusses royal PR, amongst other things, is on BBC Sounds now and on Radio 4 this evening at 9 o'clock. 20 minutes past seven, the electrical retailer Curry's has managed to fend off uh, over a takeover bid for now. But will they sell if the price is right? Sean's back with the man who being and not just you, Sean. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, Curry's share price over the last year or so fallen by 40%. Uh, it's rejected a series of bids from the investment firm Elliott Advisors who in the end walked away from the conversations last week and then since then the company said Curry's have said sales and profits would be expectations. I've got the Chief Executive Alex Baldock with me. Morning Alex. Good morning. Why do you think there's such a big gap between the board of Curry's valuation and the offer from Elliot? Well I mean, ultimately that's a matter for them. I mean, it was flattering to get the attention but the board and the big shareholders uh, were united in believing that the bids significantly undervalued us and obviously it's now on us to justify the support and we believe we can. Well, it, it's not just Elliot sort of valuing you at a, a lower price it seems. The, the stock market, the UK stock market price doesn't reflect your view at the moment. It's fallen a lot over recent years. So given how low that share price is before these bids, investors generally think you're worth a lot less than you think. Why is that? Well, you're right that there's a, there is a mismatch there. I mean, we've just sold our Greek business, for example, and that the whole of the group was valued at the same price that we just sold Greece for. Uh, the share price would be more than twice up as high now as it is today. And, you know, of course, the UK stock market's got its issues, and those have been well publicised. I mean, investors have seen the UK economy as low growth, as political instability, there are some technical problems with UK equities, and it doesn't help when the pool you're swimming in is draining away within 30 months of outflows from UK equities. But you're not going to so, find so me... So just on that, no, but just on that, I mean, you say it's well often talked about, but it, is that an issue, why you're getting bids from companies that are way lower, almost trying to take advantage of those weaknesses of the London stock market right now? 
No doubt the London market has got its weaknesses, yes. I mean, and you can see that in the in the flows of money. I mean, there's less investment money to go around. 30 months now of uh, outflows from UK equities. And we can talk about what, what should be done about that and providing a stable and predictable environment and providing the right conditions for growth and getting rid of some unnecessary friction like stamp duty on shares. But ultimately, it's down to people like me, Sean. And it's, it's down to companies not to whinge about the market. But it's still possible to go up and down the escalator. You just have to work at it harder. And I think what carries the show is that our performance is strengthening. Our UK business has shown momentum. We're getting the audits back on track. We've got rock solid finances. And it's a show new market. And we need to carry on showing that strength in the performance. Just briefly, Alex, um, this morning we've had these latest inflation figures showing price rises over the last year have been at 3.4% on the whole. How are the price pressures in your supply chain now? They're definitely easing. And uh, we're also seeing uh, lower inflation coming through in cautiously more confident consumers. I think you can overdo the gloom about the UK consumer. Yes, they still feel under financial pressure, but the confidence is trending up. Employment's still high, real wages are climbing, still got savings, interest rates are peaked, and our UK performance is pretty encouraging. Alex, thank you very much. Alex Bolder, Brown, the Chief Executive of the Alex. And Sean, thank you very much. It's 23 minutes past seven. <coughs> Excuse me. The National Audit Office, NAO, has said that plans to house asylum seekers on old military bases and a barge will cost tens of millions of pounds more than using hotels. They also accuse the Home Office of making, they quote, fruitless payments. The Home Office disputes these claims. Mark Eason, our home editor, uh, can take us through some of the Mark warning. Uh, it was very much cast, wasn't it, as uh, you know, the idea of these military bases or this barge was cast as the solution to one of the biggest political problems government has, one of the big concerns that the public have, which is over what to do uh, with asylum seekers. And yet, the NAO says, you could actually not solve the problem, but make it more expensive. Yeah, there's a strange tale behind this. I'm not quite sure where we are this morning. What we have got here is a brutal assessment of the government's plan as you say, to move asylum seekers out of those expensive, controversial hotels and into military bases, the Bibby Stockholm barge and other barges. And the idea was to save the taxpayer money, of course. And the, uh, uh, the National Audit Office is saying that in the medium term, over the next four years or so, it'll actually be more expensive. Instead of saving tens of millions, it'll cost £46 million pounds more. And why? because the Home Office cuts so many corners trying to get it ha to happen fast. They spend millions on reserving barges, preparing a military base, which will never be used. They spent tens of millions on porter cabins before they'd signed contracts. They pursued all kinds of deals like Pontins holiday camps and then cancelled that deal. And perhaps most importantly for the NAO, they, they negotiated a quarter of a billion pounds worth of contracts without a proper competitive process work given to one company because that was quick rather than with, with a proper tendering process. Now what's interesting here, so the NAO's done its sums, concluded it's all going to cost the taxpayer more than keeping migrants in hotel, hugely politically embarrassing. And oddly, in the report itself, Home Office officials are reported to agree that that is indeed the case. Large sites will cost more than hotels. But then we had this situation yesterday evening. The Home Office sent out their response to the report ahead of its publication this morning. And it's a statement that we know was stuck in what they call clearing for quite a long time, waiting for ministerial sign-off. And that statement says the opposite. It says the latest assessment of value for money shows that large sites would be 100 £153 million pounds cheaper than hotels. Clearly a much more palatable conclusion for the Home Secretary and the government. But to achieve that conclusion, the Home Office has decided not to include all the money that, that, that it's spent on what the NEO calls its improvements, more preparing the new sites, the so-called sunk costs. So we've got this really odd situation today where we have an auditor's report, official auditor's report, which says officials in the Home Office agreed that ministerial targets were unachievable, that the cost of the process actually would be higher than keeping them in hotels, that in the rush to get asylum seekers out of the hotels, they, they didn't do the job properly, they didn't work collaboratively enough with local councils and community groups. And yet at the same time, we've got a statement, presumably from the Home Secretary, signed off by ministers, saying, no, actually, we're doing absolutely the right thing. This is the way we need to go. <laughs> Absolutely extraordinary story, and you, you, you tell it with the relish of someone who's gone at the home office for some years. Quite a long time. Yeah, no, 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 no. But it's, 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 um, 
you need that sort of expertise to make sense of the, some of the things that come out of the Home Office. Mark Easton, BBC Home Editor, thank you very much indeed for taking us through that. It's 27 minutes past seven, which means it's time for sport with Harvey. Thank you very much. It's slightly less complicated this. Chelsea women had a comfortable 3 0 win in the first leg of their Champions League quarter final at Ajax last night. It is an important season for Chelsea, for reasons we'll discuss with our football reporter, Vicky Sparks. Morning, Vicky. Uh, let's get to last night first. It felt like Chelsea were really in the in that victory. But do they now need to avoid complacency in the second leg next week? Yes, I'm sure that will be their approach after that 3 0 win in Amsterdam because Ajax showed some promise in attack, roared on by what was a record attendance for a women's football match in the Netherlands, nearly 36,000. They hit the post at 0-0 and had several good chances, but were wasteful, whereas, as you say, Chelsea were clinical. But realistically, Kaki, it would be one of the biggest upsets in women's Champions League history were Ajax, who are first-time quarter-finalists, to overturn this three-goal deficit at Stamford Bridge next week. That third goal late on from Shokunis into Chelsea really did feel Excited. Yeah, I mentioned it's an important season. It's manager Emma Hayes' last season of Chelsea after what has been lots of form for 12 years. How much is that to the European campaign? Well, Emma Hayes might play that down. You know, she talks about how the players are winners and they want to do it for themselves and for the club, but they are going for the quadruple this season, Chelsea, but the Champions League is always the one that's got away, both for Chelsea and for Hayes herself. She has won this competition as assistant manager with Arsenal back in 2007, but she admitted to me back in October that it would be a fairy tale finish to her time here to make that history for Chelsea, to lift that trophy of the manager in her own right, and I'm sure there is that added impetus for the players, even if Emma Hayes likes to play it down. Yeah, I've heard her saying that quite a lot, hasn't she? Not, not saying that it's uh, an emotional <laughs> send-off for her. And you mentioned that they are yeah. still in contention for a quadruple of trophies, but they do have a few injuries when they might be wanting to rest players considering the amount of fixtures they've got coming up. That's not really an option though, is it? No, and I think that's what's so impressive about Chelsea at the moment. As you say, they are missing a host of star players through injury, but their squad depth is exceptional and although they are now very stretched on numbers, that quality continues to shine through at this business end of the season. And the squad that they have at the moment in the last few weeks has seen them through to the League Cup final, through to the semi-finals of the FA Cup, kept them top of the WSL on goal difference, and now, with one and a half feet, I think we can say, in the Champions League semi-finals, it is all there for the taking for Chelsea. Can they do it? Yeah, it's the last few weeks of the season. Vicky Sparks, thank you very much. A few other headlines for you this morning. 18-year-old Kobe Mainu has been called up to the England men's squad for the first time. Originally named in the under-21s, Mainu has now been promoted to the senior squad for England's friendly games against Brazil and Belgium, their final matches before Gareth Southgate named his squad for Euro 2024. England centre manager Langley will leave South Sharks at the end of the season to join French at top 14 club Bayon. The move would mean the 32-year-old who has won 60 caps would no longer be eligible for England selection. And the tennis at world number two, Arena Sabalenka, intends to play in the Miami Open following the death of her boyfriend, the former ice hockey player Konstantin Koltsov. Koltsov, who was in Miami with Sabalenka, has died at the age of 42. Sabalenka is the second seed in Miami and faces Spain's Paula Bedoza on Thursday or Friday. Racing tips this morning, Market Raisin, which Amal is a famous race course, not the name of a horse. <laughs> Five past four and number six is the horse, Rocco Royale and Haydock 425, number seven, Yeland. What threw me is that I thought you were describing the horse and not the famous course. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I think the less I say about the racing, uh, the better. Uh, Carthy, thank you. On BBC iPlayer. This story that I'd never heard before. Real people, unbelievable stories, including another body. You think videos can make someone appear as though they're saying or doing something that they're not. There is no woman in the world is safe from this technology. Beyond Utopia. There is no freedom of religion, no freedom of thought, no freedom of press in North Korea. And revenge, our dad the Nazi killer. They all believe dad was responsible for taking out a Nazi fugitive living in Australia. Storyville. Watch on BBC iPlayer. Quick look at the weather. Cloudy today with rain clearing eastwards, drier and brighter to the southeast and northwest. You're listening to today on Radio 4 with Amal Rajan and Katia Adler. Time for a summary of the news now with Jane Steele. There's been a sharp fall in the rate of inflation. It dropped to 3.4% in the year to February, down from 4% in January. It's lowest level for more than two years. 
The ONS chief economist, Brian Fitzner, told us there'd been a large fall in food inflation. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt said the figures showed the government's plan was working and inflation was forecast to hit the 2% target within months. But the shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, said prices were still high. The Home Office has described as highly addictive and incredibly dangerous 15 powerful synthetic opioids which have now been banned. Most of the substances involved are super-strength street drugs known as nitazines. There have been more than 100 deaths in the UK linked to nitazines since last summer, and drug experts say the government needs to do more to establish the extent of the problem. The public spending watchdog, the National Audit Office, says government plans to house asylum seekers at former military bases and on barges will cost tens of millions of pounds more than using hotels. Ministers say the figures include set-up costs and insist it's better value to continue with the sites. The U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is arriving in the Saudi city of Jeddah. He's due to hold talks with Arab leaders on a longer-term post-war plan to govern and secure Gaza. The U.S. is trying to secure a deal to put the Palestinian Authority back into the territory for the first time since it was driven out by Hamas 17 years ago. The Department for Education says there are now more teachers than ever after a report warned that the shortage of teachers in England has reached a critical state. The Independent National Foundation for Education Research says teaching is struggling to compete with other graduate jobs. The DAV says it's offering bursaries of up to £3,000 to attract the brightest and the best in subject areas where there are shortages. An investigation has reportedly begun at the clinic in London which treated the Princess of Wales in the claims staff tried to access her private medical records. The Daily Mirror alleges at least one staff member at London Clinic in Marylebone was involved. Jane, thank you very much indeed. The time now is 27 minutes to 8. And to Sudan now, because uh, let's be frank, the monumental humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in Sudan hasn't got the attention it deserves. And to be clear, Sudan today could soon become the biggest humanitarian crisis the world has ever seen. Close to 6 million people are internally displaced. 1.4 million people have fled as refugees. 25 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. 25 million people. Well, BBC journalists have now been to the front line and what they've seen is horrifying. Mass rape, extreme sexual violence, the prospect of famine, soaring food costs, and in Darfur to the west, something resembling what the US described as genocide 20 years ago. The BBC News website is leading this morning with a remarkable and shocking report by our journalist Feras Kilani in Sudan and Mercy Juma in, Ch in Chad. Very much worth your time. And one of those that they've spoken to is Ikra at a malnutrition clinic at a hospital in South Sudan. Her three-year-old daughter, Manasek, is suffering from severe malnutrition. <laughs> We fled from Khartoum after the war erupted. The rapid support forces kicked us out of our homes and we ran away. We left our belongings and our families. We became homeless. We can't get good food, the kids are sick and I can't get the medication. We are so tired. Well, they also spoke to Zainab who was displaced from Darfur and spoke to our BBC team in Port Sudan. I left Darfur after four months. We suffered at that time. Sometimes when we got out of our house, we found dead bodies nearby our door. It's possible that anyone who doesn't have anything to do with this war and just walking by in the street gets killed. Once I got out of my house with my six-year-old boy and we saw someone killed and he had a bullet in his forehead. My boy couldn't sleep that night. There's been looting and thefts all the time. Let's speak now to Dr. Arif Noor. He's the country director in Sudan for Save the Children, currently in Port Sudan, which is in the east of the country. Dr. Noor, good morning from London. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Well, can you just give us a sense of the, the scale of the crisis you're seeing unfold in Sudan? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think this is already one of the largest humanitarian crisis that the world has uh, witnessed in recent past. Uh, as you had mentioned in your remarks, more than 50% of the total population of the country, that's 25 million people, are in desperate need of humanitarian assistance. And of these, a staggering 14 million are children. And more than 8 million people have been displaced. And uh, 
Uh, 18 million people are acutely food insecure. And what's also more worrying is that 19 million uh, school-age children are at risk of losing out on their education because the schools and colleges and universities in the country uh, have still not opened properly. There has been widespread destruction of infrastructure. The health system has virtually collapsed. Uh, the schools, as I mentioned, are not working. Uh, there are uh, electricity outages, uh, water is not available, uh, in, especially in the war affected states, which account for almost almost half of the country. And do you and feel, Dr. Uh, Noor, that the international community has really grasped what is happening in the country and that you're getting the support you need? Uh, unfortunately, no. I don't think that the international community realizes what's happening in Sudan, that, that this war has been ongoing since, uh, since April 15th last year. We are almost one year into the war and still the, uh, there seems to be, the, the conflict seems to have been forgotten completely and overshadowed by other things that are happening across the world. So the, I think the international community has lost track of this uh, crisis and it's pretty much a for forgotten war uh, from where we stand. Uh, it seems like already a forgotten war. Dr. Arif Noor, Save the Children, Country Director in Sudan. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Port Sudan. Let's turn now to Sir Nicholas Kay, former UK ambassador to Sudan from 2010 to 2012. He was in Port Sudan just last month. Sir Nicholas, good morning. Good morning, Anna. Uh, it's absolutely, I mean, extraordinary uh, listening to Dr. Noor describe the situation in, in Sudan at the moment. He just said there's 14 million children facing uh, extreme hunger. Um, he also used the phrase forgotten. He said it's a forgotten war. Is it forgotten or has it just been ignored? Yeah, I've read so many articles and media pieces talking about the forgotten war. It can't be forgotten. It isn't forgotten. It is being deprioritized and ignored, unfortunately, in this uh, terrible context in which it's having to compete for attention with the tragedy in Gaza and in Ukraine. And unfortunately, it's been losing that competition. And it's an extremely complex conflict because of the way in which this vacuum is drawing in so many other African powers and uh, failed states. Just before we get there, for people who don't really know what this conflict is about, can you just spell it out for us? Because you've got the Sudanese army, which has got uh, some elements uh, loyal to former President Omar al-Bashir, and then you've got their former ally, the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, who have their roots in the infamous Janjaweed that some of our listeners will uh, remember uh, being referred to years ago. What are they fighting over, Sir, Sir Nicholas? Uh, the two factions and the two generals leading them are fighting over control, access to resources and power. Um, and this is the outcome legacy, really, of 30 years of military rule under General Bashir and the absence of democracy. Uh, so the sort of grip on the economy and the country in general by the military over those years has led to this. Uh, but it's also a result of those um, uh, tensions that have existed in Sudan over years and decades, really, between the center that controls all the resources, Khartoum and the Nile Valley, and the neglected, marginalized periphery, which is uh, also including Darfur. So there's deep-seated uh, political uh, issues, really, behind these uh, warring generals uh, tearing uh, themselves and the country. Apart. And quite apart from the humanitarian imperative, which is profound, do people in this country, particularly people in positions of power and international diplomats, need to be mindful, and how mindful do they need to be of this strip of instability now that links the Sahel in the west right through Mali, Niger, Chad and Sudan all the way to the Red Sea in the east? Indeed, um, a strip of instability going east-west across Africa, as you say, from Sahel to, to the Red Sea, is is definitely a factor but there's also north south factors too i mean the, the, the east sudan ethiopia and above sudan uh, egypt are deeply affected by the crises and see themselves as having strategic interests uh, there as well because of the waters of the nile flowing um, and the competition that we're seeing in the red sea now sudan has a large red sea coast uh, and competition for 
access and control of the Red Sea, for ports to have ports on the Red Sea. Uh, the Sudan conflict is, is not just sort of sucking in um, external powers. External powers are uh, deliberately and, and willingly interfering there. And this is one of the biggest dangers now. You can see, um, for example, the Sudanese armed forces uh, reportedly receiving support from Iran. Uh, from Egypt, a traditional ally, ally, and then the rapid support forces on the other side, widely reported to be receiving support from the United Arab Emirates as well. Okay. Uh, so the dimensions of the conflict in Sudan go well beyond uh, Sudan itself. Indeed, well, we, we shall return to it. So Nicholas K, former UK ambassador to Sudan, thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's 18 minutes to 8, time to have a look at some of the other stories uh, making uh, the papers today, also uh, on websites. The Daily Telegraph says, uh, Tories narrowly back Sunak to lead party. Uh, they quote uh, a poll which is run for the Daily Telegraph by Savanta, showing that 45% of Tory voters agree that Mr Sunak should be Conservative leader for the election, with 37% wanting someone else. Uh, the rest didn't express a view. The paper says a narrow margin of support comes as the Prime Minister is dogged by speculation that some Tory MPs on the right want him to be replaced. The New York Times has an interesting editorial by Thomas Friedman. Netanyahu is Biden's big problem. It says America's Middle East strategy depends on Israel partnering with non-Hamas Palestinians. Israel's premier, Benjamin Netanyahu, is making that impossible. It says that's a threat to Joe Biden's foreign policy goals, but also his re-election chances. And just to reiterate, if you